Hi, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. Welcome to today's Vote Her In episode featuring Lise Hogue, the president of NARAL Pro-Choice America. The Vote Her In series airs every other week and is a partnership between Two Broads Talking Politics and author and speaker Rebecca Sive. This series shares with you stories of the movement to elect our first woman president and inspirational advice and strategy related to it. Enjoy! Everyone, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. We are in episode 16 of the Vote Her In series, a partnership with author Rebecca Sive, where we share the stories of the movement to elect our first woman president. So I'm joined today, of course, by Rebecca. Hello, Rebecca. Hi there. And today we have a special guest joining us. We're thrilled to welcome Elise Hogue, who is the president of NARAL Pro Choice America. Hello, Elise. Hello. Thanks for having me. Well, it's a treat for you to be here. You know, when we started this Voter In series, we thought, well, we're going to roll out this story as best we can of, you know, what's happening in the movement to elect a president, but also to talk about the related issues of women in public office and women getting elected in a variety of uh, contexts. And, of course, the issues that you know, many women run on and many women activists, certainly those who listen to this show, uh, are concerned about. And I know we talked earlier that, uh, you know, in light of the timing of this episode, the day after yet another debate, we thought it would be good to kind of just kick it off with, I know you've commented a bit on Twitter, but if you could kind of give us your views on, well, what didn't we hear? What should we hear? How should these candidates male as well as female, uh, approach the issue of reproductive rights? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, let's start at the top. There wasn't a single question about the absolute crisis we're facing, not just in abortion access, which actually has been going on for some time, but in the criminalization of abortion, the attempts to absolutely go to the Supreme Court and undo the precedent of Roe, and all that that means both substantively and symbolically about, you know, a women's place in society right now. Now, I don't want to go too far over into, like, the, the – I don't want your listeners to think because it wasn't brought up at the debate that we're seeing the candidates ignore it, because right. I think those are two different pieces, and that's a really important distinction for us, because we actually are seeing the candidates pay attention to it. We are seeing them develop and put out plans about how they will address the absolute crisis and reproductive freedom. And we are seeing them lean into it on the campaign trail. Um, and that is a really positive development, right? Both because they see it as a political necessity, but also because they see it. They see the um, connection between these um, attacks and disparities and how it affects people's lives and livelihoods and, you know, ability to actually get to chart their own destiny. And so that's a really positive development. So I think we really need to disaggregate sort of the way that the, right. the sort of traditional media has approached this moment versus the candidates themselves. Exactly. And on that point about the candidates, I mean, here we are with three women running for president. This is sort of an old refrain at this point. I mean, but a glorious one, right? Six months out from, uh, significant moments in time, but I, I wondered if you could talk about in that context and with three uh, pro-choice women how uh, the issue of reproductive rights and safe and legal abortion fits in what you see as the trajectory of, of their campaigns and uh, the goal to elect a woman. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm always clear to say that, like, we actually believe these are issues that everyone needs to address and that we are sort of with an embarrassment of riches on the stage that across the genders, we've actually had wonderful partnerships with um, so many of the folks who stand up there. And, you know, we, we believe that everybody needs to talk about the crisis in abortion care and abortion rights right now. 
and in fact, it should only be left up to the women to do so. Um, and we're pleased that we we have seen that. I do think the fact that we have had such a plethora of amazing women running um, has helped us move away from the sense that there's like women's issues over here that deserve a tiny bit of time because there's only one or no women on the stage before uh, right recently, right? And and starting to really socialize the idea that, you know, women's issues are everyone's issues. And that's absolutely true in terms of the attacks on reproductive freedom, but that goes to the kinds of things that we're all talking about because of these wonderful female candidates like universal child care mm -hmm. and, and those kinds of things that everyone has sort of like it lip service to in the past, but haven't been sexual themes. And, and I do think it matters that, you know, people bring their own experience. I think Elizabeth's story about her Aunt B was so resonant right. because it personalizes, but otherwise would necessarily be like abstract issues. I was actually with um, Representative Alyssa Slotkin last night at an event, and she was um, telling a wonderful story about how at her first um, her husband, who was a, a very highly decorated uh, serviceman, you know, he went to his first congressional spouse event. Mm -hmm. And that the, in the sort of gift bags at the end were Laura Ashley gift bags with a scarf. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I think what's really happening is so fascinating, right? Because you've got institutions, be they Congress or big media, um, conglomerates that are very, very slow to adapt, but you've got a cultural inflection point where women and women's perspectives and women's stories are really dominating. And so we're going to see a little bit of that, like, real tension between the two. Um, but in the end, I think these real lived experiences are too common for too much of a uh, important demographic for the Democrats to ignore. You know, there's so many things going on all the time and so many things sort of taking our attention. And, you know, we, we have these attacks on reproductive freedom. But I'm wondering if you could sort of help us sort of focus in on what are the things people should really be paying attention to, the the federal issues that are important, the states that we should be thinking about. Uh, we like to sort of give people action items. but and, and I know right now it's just so it feels like everything is is bad and terrible and there's so many things to think about. I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, what, that the sort of state trajectory of, um, you know, what, what we call the abortion bans or forced pregnancy bills um, were very attention grabbing. And it is crucially important that we pay attention to them because they stand to have terrible, devastating impact um, on the states where they, if, uh, you know, left unchallenged, take effect. Um, and at the same time, it will, will add, we've got to actually also be able to focus on the states where, because of the elections in 2018, we were able to make great strides, right? right. So when we think about sort of the work we do, which we, we call ourselves a full-service advocacy organization because we do not win elections just to win elections, although we see elections as a, 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 you know, one of the primary tools to build political power so that we can show up the day after elections and make material difference on people's lives. And, you know, you take Maine, for example, which we've been using a lot because we have a huge membership in Maine. They were extremely activated um, in the effort to lobby Susan Collins to vote no on Brett Kavanaugh's nomination. Of course, they did not achieve that, <laughs> but they, oh my goodness, did they then work very, very hard in the elections um, where we were able to get a pro-choice governor for the first time in a while and like a wonderful one in Governor Janet Mills there, flip the state Senate and work very closely with the Speaker of the House, Sarah Gideon, to pass not one but two pro-choice bills through that state legislature. That was such a rewarding experience. And then, of course, when it comes time to look at 2020 and making Susan Collins accountable for her refusal to 
that are women in her voting decisions, we get to support a champion who just passed two bills for us and Sarah Gideon challenging Susan Collins. So I think that, um, you know, part of our job here, you guys as hosts of this podcast, certainly us as people who believe in the deep power of organizing, is to talk about how we can be supercharged by these moments of urgency, be they Kavanaugh, be they the abortion ban, but also channel that into positive change that is actually happening right now. It's happening in real time. So one of the things related to that, and I know Kelly has experienced this too, and we've discussed it. Um, We had a wonderful conversation on the podcast with Jan Schakowsky about this. There are a lot of different organizations as well as a lot of different activities. And sometimes people are sort of, you know, a little bit kind of struggling to figure out where to put their time or even where to put their money. And in that context, I thought it would be really helpful Uh, for the listeners to hear from you about how NARAL works in partnership, for instance, with Planned Parenthood and with some of the organizations that, you know, work to elect candidates. And, um, you know, my sort of hope behind that is to encourage people to say, well, wherever you want to go is great. But on the other hand, uh, from your perspective, Elise, you know, how do those partnerships work and how do you recommend that someone who's kind of newly activated, you know, make that decision? Yeah, I mean, so we absolutely love working in partnerships with all the organizations. Um, We think we all have a role to play. And, you know, I often talk about the fact that because I didn't come from the women's sector or the reproductive rights sector, um, I find it somewhat unique when people are like, but I did one organization, whereas like if you go to other movements that are better resourced, people understand that it requires a movement, it requires resourcing a movement to actually make durable change. So, you know, we are the oldest political abortion rights organization in the country, and that is all we do. And when we say that, you know, we talk about our full service advocacy shop that allows us to build political power for anyone and everyone of all genders who wants to work with us on these basic fundamental freedoms and then translate that into legislative and cultural change. That means that, you know, we are securing these, these freedoms long term. Um, that means when, you know, you think about Emily's list, oh God, we love partnering with Emily's list in specific races for female champions. And we do that wherever possible and we make sure that our work is not redundant and we're bringing our organizing power to bear. Well, Emily's List does a lot of the fundraising for the candidates. And, um, you know, when it comes to Planned Parenthood, of course, we work very closely with them, particularly on the legislative advocacy around their health care provision. And there, you know, we always remind people there is a vast terrain beyond that that allows us to secure abortion rights, and that includes advocating um, for the policies that help independent abortion providers and holds people accountable that may vote right on Title X but don't always vote right on abortion rights. And so we see ourselves as um, having the, the liberty and the responsibility to be the forward flank of the movement, constantly sort of evolving our um, strategies to make sure that we are, you know, pushing the envelope in service of our mission, which is to support reproductive freedom for all women. So you just mentioned that you didn't uh, come out of this kind of work. Could you talk a little bit about your personal trajectory uh, getting into this work and, and coming to NARAL? I'm a um, ecologist by training, and I spent the first part of my career at the sort of doing international work at the convergence of human rights and ecological integrity, um, and loved it. Um, I loved that work. I traveled all over the world. I saw what we know to be true in almost every culture I worked in, which was that um, systems work better when women have a seat at the table, and women have a seat at the table when we are supported in, in our reproductive freedom, and that means, of course, being able to plan our families, but also where you have a culture that supports women who have become parents, right? Um, so I sort of, you know, came at this from an ecological perspective, but it's it's irrefutably true that women-centered cultures and women-centered policies just simply do better on any metric. 
after the 2000, you know, I got very involved in anti-war activism um, during the Iraq war after the 2004 election. Um, I was devastated that that Bush had rewon White House and um, the guys, and they were all guys at the time, at MoveOn.org, who I knew through a variety of ways, cajoled me to come back to the United States and invest in, you know, sort of domestic organizing. And, and I did that, and it was fascinating. You know, I learned so much because, of course, MoveOn was, was sort of on the vanguard of technology-enabled participation and democracy. But I remember very clearly being not that surprised, but, you know, interested in the fact that the, the one of the revolutions that move on ushered that I think has actually put an undertold part of the story is that the majority of active members were women. And part of the reason for that is that they were able to tap in to the talent and the energy of a segment of um, the American population that had previously been shot out because they were juggling kids and work and often more stay-at-home moms. And um, the t ability to sort of take action and get really involved on your own time through technology, we started to see women come out of the woodwork and dominate sort of the, the move on system in terms of their ability to have impact and volunteer. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. But I think a real, you know, I, I always point to two tipping points about how I ended up at AWOL. The first was during the ACA fight when I was leading the healthcare work for MoveOn. And um, one of the things that uh, was surprising to me, quite honestly, I mean, MoveOn was very focused on at the time <laughs> the public option and getting the public option included in the ACA was when I heard about sort of the, the Stupac amendment coming down the pike. And I was like, well, right that kind of blew my mind. I mean, I sort of had always thought of um, this as, you know, much like many people in my generation as, um, well, Democrats are pro-choice and abortion is not that controversial within the caucus. And of course, at the time we had a trifecta, we had the Senate and the House and the White House. So I was really kind of taken by surprise and floored when Stupac passed. And I started to really understand the precarious nature of the Democratic Party's relationship at the time to um, abortion rights and how it was being used against us, even though I knew at the time working for an organization like Move On that there was far more energy around abortion rights than we were tapping into. I knew we had six million members who were pro-choice who didn't know what was happening when it came to Stupac. So I, I that was one tipping point. And then I ended up leaving Move On after the 2010 elections. And I was doing a lot of writing for CNN and The Nation. And I was writing when, in the 2012 election, a man who was challenging Claire McCaskill for her Senate seat in Missouri by the name of Todd Aiken said that thing where, you know, we don't right. need a rape exception for abortion um, because if it's a legitimate rape, body shuts the whole thing down. And it was amazing to me, not that he had said it, because at that point I was actually familiar with how radical the ideology of the anti-choice movement was, but that it changed, that, that A, it was an unforced error, right? Like nobody trapped him into saying it, that he was just speaking his truth, and B, it changed the trajectory not only of that race, there was probably going to lose, you know, if he hadn't said that, but also the entire national conversation around 2010 or 2012, if you guys remember. And I, that was when I was like, wow, we are really underutilizing, <laughs> you know, um, potential energy and potential power because of some kind of internal stigma around abortion that has actually played into the hands of the right wing. And so I wrote a piece about that for the nation. And I think that honestly is what put me on the radar screen for um, the NARAL board when they were searching for a successor. So that's how I ended up where I am today. You know, when you talk about this, and as I was thinking about the, you know, this conversation with you, I, of course, remembered uh, my own experience on the NARAL board, and that goes back uh, to the early years of the Reagan administration when, you know, there was also a hateful view about women and women's reproductive rights. And, you know, here we are, 
many years later and figuring out how to keep moving. And I wanted to make sure before we uh, close, which is, you know, not right away, but I wanted to make sure that you could, by way of perhaps telling our listeners about the upcoming 50th anniversary, also share with them about, you know, the idea that, uh, at least in my view, an anniversary is more than a party. It's about reflecting back, looking forward, seizing important ideas and actions. So perhaps if you could share that sort of context. Absolutely. So NARO was founded in 1969. Rebecca quite possibly knows the story better than I do, but I've gotten pretty hard on it. You know, I, I always like to go, when we talk about the 50s, I always like to go back further than that because really NARO was catalyzed by a group of young women called the Army of Three who worked through the late 50s and early 60s to um, create a network of of vetted medical professionals who young pregnant women could go to pre-row safely to have their pregnancies terminated. And I was uh, so honored and privileged earlier this year to be able to lift up the work of the Army of Three through their remaining um, living member, Pat McGinnis, who was in her 90s, and we were able to honor in San Francisco. Um, But the Army of Three obviously recognized that um, running an underground network was not a sustainable solution. They were reaching a fraction of the women who had need, and the stakes were getting really high. People were losing people. Uh, Women were dying. And so they recognized the need to build political power to um, get rid of the laws that create conditions for reproductive oppression, specifically the abortion restriction law. So in 1969, this extraordinarily venerable group of writers and thinkers and politicians and physicians came together in Chicago um, for a weekend summit. And, you know, from what we've read and understand, there was a contingent that said we should only lobby for the removal of abortion restrictions in case of rape and incest. And you know, the famous feminist Betty Friedan was the one who led the faction that said, absolutely not. Women will never be fully equal unless we can all control our own reproduction. We shouldn't need an excuse to terminate unwanted pregnancies. And and thank God her faction prevailed. And so NARAL was born out of that gathering in 1969. Our first board of directors was so impressive, including People like Senator Maureen Neuberger from the great state of Oregon and Shirley Chisholm and so many other esteemed people have come through the organization, either as staff or board in the last 50 years. And, you know, it was founded as the National Association to Repeal Abortion Laws. Uh, We changed our name post-Roe to National Abortion Rights Action League. Um, We've had several iterations since then, but... You know, you know, NARO was founded out of the idea that um, people coming together to build political power can actually make sure we are achieving gender equity through reproductive freedom. And when I, you know, we, we have a real conversation about how do you celebrate such an incredible anniversary at a time where we are right back on the precipice and so much is at stake. And we actually decided, in fact, that we have to. Because as you said, Rebecca, part of celebration is actually honoring and learning the wisdom from the fights we've come through in order to recommit to the fights that we are facing. And that is absolutely what we're going to be doing later this month here in D.C. with so many friends and family um, is, you know, as I say, honoring the past and, and committing to the future. And I know Kelly, because she comes at this from yet another generation, has ideas about the future and has had conversations. And maybe, Kelly, a follow-up thought from your perspective on this issue, a question to Elise. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I have grown up in a generation of women who sort of take Roe for granted, I think, uh, and are increasingly being surprised uh, by rollbacks of our reproductive freedom, I think. And so I think that for a lot of women of, of my generation and, and the millennials as well, that it, it's uh, it's becoming increasingly important 
important for us to be connected uh, with organizations like this and, and realizing this isn't part of our fat past. This is part of our, our present and our future. Uh, and so I think uh, for me, that that's sort of one of the main takeaways of the past couple of years is, is really sort of being woken up to uh, a lot of what we still need to be working on. And I, you know, I would say every successive generation has brought a new piece to the puzzle, right? When we think about the trajectory of the last 50 years, there are so many important inflection points, but one of the most significant in terms of influencing my generation of leaders was 2004 with the rise of the reproductive justice movement and women of color really being right. able to be heard among legacy organizations about the ideas of intersectionality, the ideas that we need to not just support abortion rights, but get real active on maternal mortality if we care about these things. And we're so much better as a result of it. And we owe a deep debt of gratitude to our J leaders for, you know, being willing to do that. Um, I, you know, I'm from Texas. I'm a fourth generation Texan. And, um, you know, Texas in so many ways was the canary in the coal mine for all of these anti-choice efforts and, you know, the first state to past an abortion ban kind of made, you know, Wendy Davis famous. And, you know, I always remind people that um, because so much of our perspective is often in big cities, that I actually find younger generations pretty engaged. You know, when people would ask me after I took the job, why don't young people care about this? I would be like, <laughs> please talk our office. Half of our staff is under the age of 35 and they're working their butts off, you know? And so, I think that real lesson was not that people um, of younger generations didn't care, but that we actually, as large institutions, lost our focus on thinking about organizing and communicating in a way that younger generations were hearing and receptive to and were involved in creating the messages. And once we did that, my goodness, I mean, I was mean, that last night, the one that Alyssa Slackstrom was at, that was all young people. It was all women under the age of 35 wanting to know how to use their dollars to create political impact around reproductive freedom. So we, um, you know, we are better when we have a multi-generational approach, and um, that is part of what our 50th is about. So speaking of the importance of communicating and across the generations, if you would share with us and the listeners as we close here, how can they get in touch with you? What's the best way to get involved in NARAL uh, so they have some immediate task to take on after they listen later today? Um, absolutely. Please go to our website at www.naral.org and sign up to get on our email list. We are, um, we have 2.5 million members around the country and we are a people powered organization. We believe in collective action and we will be able to tell you what is happening in your own communities and how best to get involved, not only in federal fights, although those are so important, but also state fights that we know make the day-to-day the -day difference on the ground if we know how to get in touch with you. So absolutely do that, follow us on Twitter, at N-A-R-A-L, or on Facebook, because we provide enormous amounts of um, opportunity to get involved. And same on Instagram, where, where our handle is at Pro Choice America. Well, on that note, I wanted to say thank you, Elise. Uh, we look forward to ongoing conversation. We hope you'll come back as we move forward into 2020 and um, see what's next on our agenda. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And thank both of you. I know how active you are and how much you are leaders in this fight. So thank you for all you do. The Vote Her In segment is a collaboration of Two Broads Talking Politics and author Rebecca Sive. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri. And we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at Two Broads Talking Politics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at Two Broads Talking Politics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.